Welcome to Swift Education Center's Equity Forward Forums for Educators, an ongoing series in which we connect educators and others who invest in the lives of young people with authors, thinkers, scholars, organizers, artists, and visionaries that inspire us in our work to build equity and join justice. We hope that you're inspired too. My name is Wade Kelly. I'm the Assistant Director of Content Development at Swift Education Center. Let's get started. Today is a great day because we are sitting down with Dr. Jamila Dugan. Dr. Dugan is a leadership coach, former teacher and school leader, and the co-author of Street Data, a next generation model for equity, pedagogy, and school transformation, which focuses on culturally rich educational environments and transformative approaches to learning. She began her career as a teacher in Washington, D.C., successfully supporting her school to implement an international baccalaureate program. After being nominated for Teacher of the Year, she later served as a coach for new teachers in Oakland, California. As a school administrator, Jamila championed equity-centered student services, parent empowerment, and co-led the development of the first Mandarin Immersion Middle School in the Bay Area. She has served on the boards of Independence Charter Spanish Immersion School in Philadelphia and parents of African-American students studying Chinese in the Bay Area. She holds a doctorate in education leadership for equity from the University of California, Berkeley, a master's degree in curriculum and instruction from George Mason University, and a bachelor's degree in psychology from Fresno State University. She lives in San Diego with her husband and two children. Dr. Jamila Dugan, welcome. Thank you so much, Wade. I really appreciate you having me here today. Absolutely. We're glad to have you. I'm super excited. <laughs> me too. Okay. So you recently wrote an article for ASCD that's called Radical Dreaming for Education Now. So in that article, um, you speak of a post-pandemic scramble to return to a status quo in education. Can you talk about what that looks like and feels like for educators and students? And if you want, even maybe go into some of the pitfalls of that thinking as well. Um, thank you so much for starting us in the place of what education feels like right now, um, especially um, given that this week, the national report card for um, our state test course came out and the feeling is um, difficult. The feeling is difficult um, and it's heavy. So when I, I wanna start just by thinking about the question that you just asked and how it feels in our bodies to be thinking about that question, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? This idea of a scramble back to the status quo. What does that feel like in our bodies, right? And so I think that's just the place to start because when we consider how it feels in our bodies, it's tight, it's heavy, it's sad, it's not inspiring at all. Yeah. Um, and it makes us think about, oh my gosh, the worry, right? And as I've seen articles come out about the new scores, and of course they show that from 2019 to 2022, we did not make progress, we went backwards. Um, you know, when I think about the reports and, uh, that are coming out around this, they're so anxiety provoking and so based on fear. And if you think about what humans do when they are fearful and when they are worried, we either fight or we flight, right? And so I am seeing so many administrators, so many teachers feeling immense amount of pressure to get back to normal and to hurry up and get to somewhere. And that somewhere, I don't even know that we know where the somewhere is. And right. we all have gotten to that somewhere before the hundred times that we've tried. Um, right. And so I think that the feeling, what it really looks like and feels like is people scrambling, as you said, people trying to figure out how can I quickly get back on track? There's urgency, even as you hear my voice, right? It's, yeah. it's quick, it's trying to figure out how to fix yeah. it, right? Even panic, it's almost like a panic. Right, it's right. like a panic. And so that, goes levels down, levels down, and it creates an immense amount of stress. And I think that there are some pitfalls in that, some equity traps and tropes, which I talk about in the street data text with Sheen Safir. And there's a couple that, that just resonate with me when I think about this particular issue. First of all, when you're moving from a place of fear and worry, you start to just figure out what to do, right? 
what can I just do? What, what can I figure out as quickly as I can to put in place so that we fix this and then we become fixers? And so one of the pitfalls I think is just focusing on doing as opposed to embodiment. Mm. And radical dreaming is really about embodiment, really slowing down and thinking about who do we wanna be in this world and how do we wanna operate? And then what, we, what, what will we do after that, right? It's really trying to push against this feeling of urgency. And even when I start to talk about that, you see me slow down. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a pitfall around doing there. And I think there's a pitfall also around being superficial. We can be honest that right. before the pandemic, we were not supporting every student right. um, or every community or every family. And so if we start just figuring out the intervention and trying to rush and figure out what to do, then we're going to do the same thing we've done, which is come here on the surface mm -hmm. and not get down to the roots, the structures, the systems. The, the discourse, the way we've been operating with folks, and we fall into that trap of superficial equity. And so I think that to, to make it, you know, bring it all together, that idea of panic that you brought and distress and heaviness is really how it's, it's feeling in schools. And it's looking like us moving with crazy sense of urgency and tons of burnout. Right, right. That makes sense. It's it's interesting too the way that if we are in a panic to return back to this status quo, not only if we were to even get back there, I, I feel like not only would it be as bad as it was, it might actually be worse because now our energy is so off. It's way off because we came into it with this rush, with this fear, with without hope, without dreaming. It was just like, you know, um, so that's that makes a lot of sense. Um, and that has to do I had a you know second follow up question that had to do with with leading in fear. So that. I think is a, a nice little um, a dovetail into like this concept because one way we're scrambling because we just feel like it's like, like you said, the panic, the, uh, the scramble, the, the essentially when you look at it from a human standpoint, it's almost like the return back to something that's comfortable. And we know in this in this work in justice work and equity centered work, we're not searching out what's comfortable. So that's all wrong already. Um, you know what I'm saying? So we're already going the wrong direction with that. Um, so do you have anything else to add about leading with fear, about how that feels for the kiddos when you have people around you that have that kind of energy in that space? Yeah, I mean, I think there's just a, a, a bit to um, unpack a little bit more, which is this notion um, that fear is useful um, in terms of figuring out what to do next, right? I think that we have misinterpreted uh, why or the purpose of fear, right? Fear breeds awareness, right? That something is going on, right? After that, we don't necessarily know if it should tell or, or, or if it needs to guide exactly what we do, right? It just gives us awareness that there is something that is going on and that we may need to respond in a certain kind of way. Because if, if there is a snake trying to bite you, you do not want to immediately jump because the, the, the snake may, may get you, right? But if you notice, you need to take a moment and you need to think about what does it make sense for me to do in this particular situation. And in certain circumstances, you may need to move quickly, but you certainly don't want to just jump from the place of fear, right? And when you jump, when you do jump from the place of fear, then you are liable, we are liable to undermine ourselves, right? To really undermine what's, in, in, uh, what's best for us. And children do that too. And so if you think about us being adults leading in a system or in a school, in a classroom, and we're trying to help kids be the best that we can, that they can be, but we are leading from this place of fear, this reactionary place, then that energy comes off onto students. It comes off in homes too, right? Like I, I don't want to act like I've never operated <laughs> here. That, 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 that does happen and it happens a lot, right? Um, but that energy comes off to kids and they can feel it. And now we've added to their anxiety. It's, it's not to say that we haven't experienced great trauma. That's the other piece I just want to add. It's not to say that. That right. is, is true. We've had a, we've lost a lot of people. Yeah. There's been kids who 
been displaced and families who've been, I mean, there's so many things, people have lost their jobs, right? All of that is happening, but it's what we decide to do once we understand what has, you know, the, the fear associated with that, right? Mm-hmm. Or the loss associated with that. Do we lead from that place and say, now I'm going to scramble and try to hurry up and get my life back? Or do I need to take the time to slow down and think about what are the implications of this particular moment that we're in? What are the implications if we move from a place of fear? And how can we really be, how can we operate differently? Mm-hmm. You know, how can we, can, how can we make a decision to take what fear is telling us and a whole bunch of other things, which is what I talk about in radical dreaming. How do we take all of that into account and then move from there so that we don't keep getting bitten by these snakes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, or, or another way of saying that to me is almost like re-traumatizing, you know, yeah. it's just like we, we are coming into these situations traumatized. The kiddos in a lot of ways are coming in these situations traumatized. And then if we come into it operating out of fear, it reminds me of like when you're holding a cup of coffee or something and, and you get scared by something, but then you spill the coffee and the coffee burns your hand too. <laughs> and, and then the, and it stains your clothes. So it's like you're doing extra damage just because you've come into that situation, not being calm and not having your, your wits about you. That's, that's a, that's interesting. Um, so in the, in the article, you t- you talk about um, your experience with a former student. Um, and this experience um, I thought was just a, such a great illustration of sort of this organic like educator student connection um, that is just so beautiful. It just really feels like the lifeblood of what education is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in this story, it culminates with you having like this realization that, um, you have this quote in there that you said that fixing him and the rest of your students was like a setup for failure. Yeah. Um, can you tell that story or talk about that story and how you arrived at that conclusion Uh, is just fascinating. So beautiful that we're talking about this because, um, Mikkel and my students were in kindergarten when this happened, and I just saw Mikkel at Winston-Salem State last week, and it is so amazing to see what it is like when we build strong relationships with students and maintain them where we can. We can't always do that, but I had a chance to be with Mikkel in person, talk to Mikkel's mom again. She was like, um, I hope you are about to give Miss Dugan a whole bunch of love because you know how many times you tore up her classroom, right? And I was like, <laughs> no, I told you. That you don't remember, you don't remember throwing them chairs at me in the, in the classroom. But mom does. She remembers all of those conversations. Mm-hmm. And I, I also just feel so lucky because Mikkel was able to connect me with other students that I taught. And so I got to FaceTime them as well. So it's just amazing to be able to feel the realness of that that story I was telling. And he did give me permission to write about it and talk about it now. Oh, good. So I I think the first thing to do is, you know, we we come into this conversation and we're talking about the notion of of fear. And, you know, there's some things I'm suggesting, but I I, I don't want to um, send the message that I am not a human being (laughs) that has operated from that place and operates from that place at times. I'm really trying to slow down and think about when I didn't make that choice to be coming from fear or how I evolved Mm -hmm. um, and how it was helpful to me to not come from that place. And I've been trying to think about my own personal story and that of others as in, in hopes that that can give us another, you know, someone else an aha moment or make a pit, you know, help someone else pivot and then Mm -hmm. still remind ourselves that we're human and it's not going to be perfect every time. So I just want to say that starting out. Um, but the story of Mikkel is one of my, my favorite, um, to tell because he really did transform, um, me as a person and did lay the foundation for how I would teach moving forward. And so here's how it begins. Jamila's 21. She becomes a teacher. Somebody allows her to be in a classroom. And <laughs> You know, they put their trust in me to be with a room of 24 kindergartners. And in that, I had so much passion and love for my kids. I wanted to do right by my children. And I believe every educator in my building wanted to do the exact same thing. Um, We were, you know, we weren't bad people. We did a lot of amazing things, right? And at the same time, when I came in particular, uh, I came in at a particular time where my school had just not met AYP, adequate yearly progress. 
And if you remember, No Child Left Behind comes in and there's these report cards and you need to you know, get to a certain place. And for the first time, my school had not gotten there. And that scramble was there. There was a lot of urgency to figure out how to fix this. And not to mention, I was a part of an organization that was all, um, how I came into teaching, it was all about solving or fixing the achievement gap. So I had this narrative and this AYP narrative kind of coming together. Mm-hmm. I very much wanted to set up systems and structures in my classroom that would help kids thrive. And uh, I set those up. And when I set those up, they're supposed to work and we're supposed to be able to just move on, <laughs> except it doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, and I had several students, Mikkel being one of them, who was not about to fit into the systems and structures I thought were the ones that needed to be there. And so I freaked out. Him throwing those chairs at me. <laughs> And other children, I, I freaked out. I felt like, why is the student in my classroom? He's not ready to be in school. Mm. How did he get here? What is going on at home? I mean, all the thoughts, right? right? All the thoughts that many of us have had. And so I think I, I, I will be very honest. I said to my assistant principal, I need him out of my classroom. <laughs> I need him out of my classroom fast. And the beauty of this, and I, I really want leaders to hear this piece, she asked me, do I want to work here? Mm. And that was so important for her to say to me. And mm-hmm. she said to me, 90% of what happens in your classroom, Jamila, is in your sphere of influence. It's 90%. 10% I'll give you, but 90%. So what are you going to do with that? And if she did not hold me accountable to a high expectation that I could do right by kids, then I don't think any of this would have happened. So I took that. I told her, yes, I do want to work here, first of all. Mm -hmm. Um, And then she gave me some ideas about where to go next. And one of them was speaking to um, Mikkel's mom to build relationship, not to fix, to build relationship. So I got to know Mikkel's mom and we talked. And as I said in the article, he had a brand new baby brother and he was just feeling alone. And he told me even last week, no, I didn't like when I had a brand new brother. I didn't like it at all. (laughs) You know, my son is the same way. When he had his little sister, he felt very isolated and alone, normal reaction, right. To that right. very normal reaction, developmentally appropriate for any student. Right. And so for him, he was acting out. He was very much acting out. And he certainly didn't believe I was going to come to support him because mm-hmm. I was focused on my systems and structures and trying to figure out how to get kids to read as right. fast as I possibly could. Right. And when mom told me about this baby brother, I just had so much empathy and my shoulders relaxed. And I was like, there ain't nothing wrong with this kid. There's nothing wrong with, he needs us right now. And so mom kind of said, well, you know, I haven't actually been spending as much time as I used to. Let me start walking the dog with him so he Mm -hmm. can get that time. She was like, that came up naturally when we both had that realization, right? And -hmm. then I was like, well, let me start spending time. Well, let me figure out how I'm going to get him to spend time with me. Right, right. So I selected a book um, around insects, or no, I asked him to tell me what he would read with me in the library. I like coerced him if he would let, if he would choose the book to be with me. And he chose a book on insects. And when I tell you that Mikkel's little eyes, they were like beaming and he started asking so many questions. Well, what's this one? And what's this? And like, oh my God, like he just, like, it was like a whole light. I, I really mean like a light came from him and I got excited. And then I started thinking, well, how am I going to like, well, I only have a couple of books around insects, right? How am I going to start building on this? Because he's really pumped about this idea. Yeah. And so after that, I started thinking, well, how do I incorporate insects into my lessons? How do I like start to incorporate stories that Mikkel is telling me about these insects that he would make up if he could? How do I do that? And we started to bond together. Mm -hmm. And then he started to trust me. And then I honestly, truly started to dream about what was possible. Mm -hmm. And the more I got away from like, I need to make this happen right now. I need Mm -hmm. to fix this issue. The Mm -hmm. more I got away from that and started to think about what does he want to do? I'm really excited about that. What is, you know, what can we do together? Mm -hmm. Things changed. And I will tell you, Mikkel came in with no letter sounds. Um, no one-to-one correspondence and, and left uh, reading on uh, end of first grade reading level when he left my classroom. And I truly believe it is because of that evolution of figuring out how do we bond together and how do we capitalize on the light in right. students and take that instead of trying to fix them, they don't need to be fixed. They need to be supported. Sure. They have needs, right? Sometimes they act out, right? Mm-hmm. 
but it's not about fixing them. It's about figuring out, okay, how do we adjust and how do we get to the light to make our adjustments as opposed to trying to see them in a deficit lens? It's all about abundance. Yeah, all about abundance. And <laughs> and what did you say? Uh, uh, capturing the light. Is that what you said? I mean, yeah. I'm, I might need that for a t-shirt. That's excellent. <laughs> That's excellent. And a beautiful story. And it and a perfect illustration of educator student connectedness. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so in this back to this article, uh, in in the section that you have entitled Active Dreaming, you outline five key points that can facilitate moving our radical dreams towards becoming reality. Yes. Um, so can you speak a little bit on those and and explain? There's a part in here where you had this quote that said, dreaming isn't for the sake of dreaming which I loved. So can you touch on those points? Yeah, super important because for a lot of folks dreaming can be like, oh, that sounds so nice and fluffy, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, there's no rigor associated with right. this idea of dreaming and that right. is completely false. And in fact, the idea of radical dreaming didn't come from me. It came from doing a study of ancestors and liber liberation movements and revolutionaries and how did they start? What did they do? Because let us remember that the pandemic has been brutal. And if we just look into history, right. we can find many other things that have been brutal as well. And right. sometimes so brutal that not, not only mentally did we experience some trauma, but physically, many, right. many, many things. How did people, <laughs> what, did, what did people do? How did they make their way out? And so um, I, I really start to think about that, how I've made my own way out of challenge. Challenge. I have a lot of degrees here, but I actually fell out of high school and my letter from failing out is right right in the back right nice. as well. And so I've been thinking about how did I make my way out um, as well? So if dreaming isn't a fluffy notion, then how do we make it a reality? How do we actually make it something that we can do? And so there's five things that I came up with. And I first just want to just quickly go back to what you said around student connectedness, because this comes up in the 10 points. It's all around like embodiment and seeing our relationships with children and staff, administrators. So there are five key points that I mentioned in terms of how to come out of this. And it really just, I wanted to start with it reminding me of the student connected piece in the 10 points because when you all talk about the relationship between students um, and educators, it's supposed to breed feelings of inspiration, right? right? And so we think about radical dreaming, just to start with this idea that it's not for the sake of dreaming, it is because we must inspire students, right? That mm -hmm. is the lifeblood of education uh, as you all uh, talk about it. So these five points, right? The first is we have the opportunity to listen to those who have come before us. I talk about that as the five points to listen and expand. So yes, there has been trauma, right? We could start from a place of listening to children and to our uh, ancestor stories of trauma and talk about, well, how do we move from a place of trauma, right? That's a question that we could ask. Yeah. Um, and that's us making a decision to stop there. Yes. I'm arguing that we can listen to the whole story. We can listen to the evolution, right? So when you think about um, folks being in bondage, right, here in this uh, country, mm -hmm. slavery as one example. The goal was not to make it to the master's house, <laughs> you know, to come out of the field for some, for some folks, right. um, for some folks who were forced to be in fields while also um, experiencing brutality. Mm -hmm. It wasn't to figure out how to get to the master's house. That's only one place, you know, that might feel a little bit better, right, if I'm mm -hmm. not in that place. It was how can I get free? Right. And I can see a world where I can be free. Right. And now I'm going to plot with my people around how we're going to make that happen. We're not talking about moving on the edge. We're talking about freedom, seeing ourselves as own, you know, our own, but right. belonging to ourselves, right? Right. That's the whole story, right? right? And even before that, we can go all the way back to Africa in this sense. And every culture can go back to somewhere and say, what was the whole story? Think about folks who have immigrated to this country, right? Mm -hmm. There was a dream that starts. So we have to listen and then we have to ask beyond the trauma. Okay, mm -hmm. so what was the, the trauma that you may have experienced? But what did you learn about yourself? What did you find out that was possible that you didn't know what was possible? 
that you didn't think was possible before? What do you believe we should do in the future? And I mean, there's so many places that we can go. So when mm -hmm. we think about dreaming, it's this, it's this starting place for us to think about what we can do and how we can continue the evolution of us as a people. So first starting with listening um, to our, our answers and our own stories and figuring out how to expand. The second is what I talked about related to this notion of fear. We cannot radically dream if we do not slow down. Mm. Slow down. You have this data and, and what Shane would say is satellite data, big data saying that things are really, really bad, right? But let's go closer. This is not our whole story. And look at the street level, slow down. What have our kids learned that we have not brought into the school building? right? What are they dreaming about? Slow mm. down, feel that. What are you dreaming about? Because for us as adults, we've been dreaming about slowing down. Right. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> we realized yeah. we're moving too fast. We need time. We need space. We need to feel like we belong. Slow down and sit in that, right? That's mm. a rigorous activity, especially for us as adults. It's very challenging for us to figure out how to slow down. Yeah. Third point, learn from the dreamers. This is re again related to the ancestral piece of this. There are so many ancestors. I talk about Dolores uh, Huerta in the um, piece, many others. There's dreamers right now. Many. I, I talk about Mar uh, Marseille Martin. She is a Black woman, the youngest producer in history. How does she do that, girl? I want to know that. And I want my kids to know about how she did that, too. Because she is a dreamer that we can learn from today, not tomorrow. She's doing it today, right? And then our kiddos. I will tell you from my son, watching him and my daughter. My daughter makes advertisements now from learning all this stuff on one of these apps with her <laughs> iPad right? and YouTube. And they make songs. She makes beads. And. There, I mean, there's so many things they've learned. Granted, I wish there was a little less screen time that they had, but they learned some stuff from that. So let's learn from those, those dreamers, the, the kids, the people who have come before us, and then dream with the kiddos, which again is rigorous because it re requires us to move out of our own mindset around what they should be doing, right? Back to my story with Mikkel and fixing. That's, that's what right? I was going to say, yeah. Right? Getting out of our own way, that's really challenging. It's right. A, my administrator to help me, Mikhail's mom to help me, and my own mindset shift for me to get out of his way, right? Yeah. So move out of the way and just be with and mm -hmm. see what they're thinking about. Ask them, what are you thinking about? And not ask them in like, what are your dreams <laughs> kind of a way, <laughs> right? Like, because sometimes adults can do that. Sure. More so saying, okay, everyone, everyone, we're stopping what we're doing today. I just want to talk to you all about what we're all dreaming about. I mean, I just watched the movie uh, Encanto. It was a, such a great movie. And it made me start thinking about all these ways that we could bring color to the classroom. What are you all thinking about, right? Like that kind of inspiration yeah. piece to dream with the kiddos and say, what are they thinking about? What do they want in this world? And mm -hmm. then finally, which I think is a really important uh, final point with this, is to dream with other educators. We have been taking so much time from our people limiting their time to plan, limiting time to think, limiting time to prepare. And that doesn't make room for dreaming. Right. And I had the luxury of being with Miss Megan Monroe, who was also a dreamer and was my partner kindergarten teacher who taught way longer than me. And we got to get in a room together and think about, well, what are we going to do with, you know, literacy? What are we going to do with math? And also I had a student uh, teacher when we changed into an international baccalaureate uh, program. And because of that shift, I feel like it just gave me the opportunity to throw everything out and say what's possible, um, mm -hmm. or specifically oral language with kindergartners. And that dreaming with her, oh my gosh, my classroom was so beautiful because she got so into the art aspect mm -hmm. of it. And mm -hmm. I got so much into the planning and dreaming together yeah. again leads to that connectedness, inspiration, and leads us to a place where those dreams can become reality because they eventually turned into lesson plans, right? Right, and right. eventually turned into concrete things we were doing in the classroom that were still aligned to standards, if that's what matters to, to you, aligned to goals, aligned to what kids needed to be able to do. So I want to make it clear the dreaming is the place to start. It's the place for inspiration. It's the place where we embody. And then we turn that into concrete plans, just like our ancestors have done before. And truly, today, you and I are here, Wade, right? 
Mm -hmm. Somebody dreamed that up for us to be here and they made a plan, right? Right. Shout out to Harriet Tubman, made a plan so that this (laughs) could be true, right? So we know for sure that this is possible. And I think those five key points can help us. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I don't know if there's any data or anything behind this, but I would venture to say that I bet that connecting with other other educators and dreaming together, that sort of collective dreaming, I would bet money that that decreases the fear and anxiety and all the things that we were talking about in the beginning. I feel like there is a healing that happens as well when you make these connections and you realize that this is bigger than lesson plans. This is bigger than returning to the status quo. This is bigger than all of that stuff. It's about a human connection with each other and with the kiddos. That's that's beautiful. 100%. Wait, I love this piece that you brought in around healing, right? That notion of healing, again, relates to embodiment, right? Mm-hmm. Which reduces the Mm -hmm. fear when we're being together and building that connection. I love that you said the healing piece. That's really important and reducing the fear. I think that's. (laughs) Thank you. Okay. So I've got one last question for you. Um, in, In reading the article, I was struck by this idea that you have where the transformative and the liberating experience of, of operationalizing radical dreaming um, is not just something that's felt by the students, um, but it's also felt by educators in a very real and very powerful way. And I'm, I'm, I wanted to get to this question specifically because this is equity forward forms for educators. And that's yeah. primarily the people who are going to be watching this. Uh, the idea that this radical dreaming is something that, that is not just a thing that's done by educators for kids. It oh, also yeah. has this reciprocal effect um, on the educators themselves. And um, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about why that might be. I mean, first of all, for all of us educators, think about that time when someone inspired you and what came out of that inspiration. Think about when you, when we were young people and we were imagining some sort of play, right? We were built, we were buildings that we were school teachers pretending, right? And we had this whole classroom idea that we could make, right? Or maybe we were knights in shining <laughs> armor or whatever it was we were doing and how fun that was mm-hmm. and how much energy that gave us and how we don't do that anymore. Yeah. And how we struggle to really get back to our own imagination and tapping into that. And what happens when we do? Mm -hmm. Another thing I think that we can take from this pandemic that doesn't just relate relate to kids is the amount of ventures that we as educators have gotten into. I mean, there's so many educators that are artists. Now you have Etsy. You can put your work there, right? That inspire you can like do both and right kind of a thing. Um, And how when we you know kind of tap into things that are interest for us, for example, singing. I can't sing, but (laughs) singing for me like is 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 a way for me to kind of be in my um, I feel like my one of my more higher selves, my my highest self, when I am like belting out and singing. And when I get to the singing, then I get to the dreaming, and then I feel like really light and buoyant. Yeah. And I love to listen to songs like there's a song called Joy and Pain by Maze and Frankie Beverly. And even when I'm in the depths of it, I'll listen to that song. It'll get me energized again. And then I start to kind of bring that spirit of inspiration and dreaming to the work. Hey, that benefits us all, right? That is the thing that brings me to my highest self, right? Which then I used to sing with my kids all the time and they thought I was corny, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but they used to do it with me too. That brings me to my highest self and it benefits my kids. It, be- it benefits me. So I ask for us as educators to really consider what are the times that we have felt like we tapped into our imagination What are the times that we felt like we were able to dream? It might even be a a best friend, someone that you know outside of school, a colleague, if it's in school. When are the times that we felt the most inspired? I can guarantee to each and every one of us that beautiful action came outside, came out of that. Beautiful every single time, right? Mm -hmm. And so if that is the case for us, we're talking about this just then impacting kids as well. So I I think it's important to say that as much as we say kids first, it's actually our oxygen masks first. Right, right. right? 
So if I can get into the spirit of dreaming and I am inspired, that does good for me. Right. That heals me. That gets me ready to show up in this world again. That gets me in the place where I am able to hold what has happened to all of us as a result of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. I'm able to hold that and what's going on in my life and hold hope. I'm able to hold what is possible. I can hold all of those things because I've put myself in a place where my oxygen mask is on and I'm doing the things that have got me to a place of dream right. and inspiration. And then that leads to energy, not just with the kiddos, to my right. colleagues, to my family, right? right. It really is for the benefit uh, of all of us. And again, I would just say, there's a cost if we don't do it. Right. A cost if we don't. I'm not saying, I, I'm not saying this again as a fluffy notion. Mm -hmm. There is a cost if we are not in the place of inspiration for ourselves and we are feeling that cost right now. So right. I am arguing and I am arguing very strongly that we have to make, it's not even sacrifice, that we have to make a choice that I am going to choose to see this as a moment, as an opportunity for something different, not just for my kids, but for myself and for the future. And if we can get to that place and then, you you know, use those five points slowing down and all of that, I really think that we can truly look to a rising sun and our future could really be great. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's, I mean, the beautiful thing, I'm listening to you talk and when you were talking about dreaming and the way that your body just responds to it, it's, it's like magical. And it's magical because we think along these lines of when you're low in energy that you need to find a, a resource to fill your cup back up. You got to fill your tank back up. You got to recharge your battery. And these are all things that you're looking for these outside resources to plug in and fill in. But dreaming is something that happens from within. And it's almost like the energy and the inspiration just happens inside out from the inside out. It's, it's a, it's a resource that is like infinite. And I just, I wish that there was, this is what I wish. I wish that dreaming was regarded as like an asset, that it was regarded as like a resource and, and that it was valued in that way as part of when you're doing, um, you know, asset management or um, um, whatever it's called, where you're taking inventory, you're taking inventory uh -huh. of your assets and what you have, that I wish that dreaming was a part of that because it is such a sustaining force if we're given enough time and opportunity to, to let it happen. So thank you for that. Yeah, can I just, I really appreciate you saying that because my greatest worry when people hear me talking about radical dreaming is even though I say it's not a fluffy notion, just the, the word dream feels yes. so distant from yeah. day to day work and my intangible. Worry, yeah. Right. Intangible. I love that you said that, right? Like right. intangible. So, you know, we don't really have time for that. There's more important things to do. Mm -hmm. But in street data, one of the arguments I love Shane, uh, that Shane makes is that what is measurable is not the same as what is valuable. So this gets into, uh, this, this gets into so, so many different things, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I, I, my, my hope similar to you is that we see this as serious. Mm -hmm. We see this as important. We see it as imperative. Yes. We really look again. I, this is not something that I've just made up. Look at any liberatory movement, mm -hmm. any liberatory movement. And it started with radical dreaming. And it started with dreaming in the face of mm -hmm. immense pain, often. Right. It, star right. it started there. It was, it was actually the resource that was used to get folks inspired and to see beyond what was right. happening right there. So let's see beyond. Let's mm -hmm. really take the time to see beyond. And if we don't do it again, there's a cost associated with that. But let's truly take the time to see beyond because our kids are already doing it. They're already doing it. Mm -hmm. and we can learn a lot from them. They have so Absolutely. much to offer. They have so much to offer. And I I, I did get Mikel's dream. Uh, it, I think I, I placed it into the article. But when I just even listen to his dreams, it makes me dream uh, more. And it does literally impact my conversation with you today, which mm. I hope 
impact somebody else's conversation later, which is, is going to impact every other piece of work that I do today. So it's a very real and ultimately tangible thing if we let it. Yeah. Well, that's my hope too. I hope that everything that you've said resonates with some of the folks that that watch this. It was just it's been a pleasure, Dr. Dugan. It's been a pleasure. I'm so glad that you agreed to collaborate with us on this. And um, I look forward to reading more from you and hearing more from you and hopefully maybe someday collaborating again. Yeah, that would be fantastic. If you haven't uh, already, you can uh, go pick up Street Data. It's an amazing text. We get into um, the, whole, the whole purpose of the radical dreaming was we talk about the barriers to moving toward equitable change and a new data framework that is based on this idea of radical uh, dreaming. So I, I think if people want to learn more, they could do that there. Um, and of course, that article and, and other things I'm writing are certainly going to be based on that pretty much forever from now on. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Jamila Duke and everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching this Equity Forward Forum for Educators. Please follow Swift Education Center on social media and visit swiftschools.org for more information on who we are and what we do. Until next time, lead with love and center the kiddos.